turn with me to Numbers chapter 16. Here, we're going to look at rebellion. I don't know why I came back Thursday night, taught on the Antichrist, and this morning I'm going to teach on rebellion. Well, Pastor Steve, couldn't you just come back and ease us in to something like God loves me? Yeah, I'm going to. But we're going to talk about rebellion, and God really opens your eyes. And there's reasons why we do certain things. All of us, in us, no matter how sweet we are, have a desire to kind of tell people, don't tell me what to do, I'll do it myself. And then there's that attitude is that, no, I'm not going to submit to anybody. I am my own man, my own woman, I'll do it my way. I mean, those are great, great moments in your life, but they're pretty crazy. Because what you're really doing is setting yourself up for God working in and through your life in a very, very hard time. And so you need to understand what rebellion really does. And Moses now brings us to a moment in our life we're going to find out. It's an incredible moment where all of a sudden you begin to realize that we treat God oftentimes as a bellhop. That's all he is. But how do I handle the hurt? Moses now is standing before his family. They have murmured and been bitter against him. And because of that, Miriam, you remember, was uh, cursed with leprosy. And we find that she had an attitude with her brother Moses because of who he married. And so she turned against him. And Aaron turned against Moses. And because of that, there's problems in the family. And then secondly, we find out he was attacked by his own friends. Those who worked with him. Those who had worshipped with him, those Levites that represented who God was. And they stood between the living and the dead. And they hung out with Aaron, the high priest, and they would stand before God and they would get things ready so we could partake. And all of a sudden, his very best friends, they turned on him. In fact, not only that, but they came to him and says, You, we don't need you any longer. Everybody's holy. And everyone's great, so now you can go. And the reason why was Korah, now listen very carefully, wanted his position. He wasn't happy with what God gave him. Now I'm also going to talk to you a little bit that if I'm rebellious, it means I'm discontent. Because when you are content, there's no rebellion. But because I'm discontent, I'm always looking for something better. And what that brings me to is you have a heart hole in your heart and that is in the shape of a heart and you cannot fill it with material things so you can have houses you can have cars or you can have gold you can have silver it will not fulfill that deep need in your life and the bible tells us in ecclesiastes god made you that way he gave you a vacuum that could only be filled with the presence of god and so you're lusting after power, lusting after all these things. And if God would give them, they would not bring fulfillment in your life. It means that you're going to have to have great fulfillment with God. Korah did not have that. His eyes wanted the priesthood. He was not happy being a Levite. He wanted to wear that priestly outfit. He wanted to be over the congregation. He wanted to lord over people's lives. His motives were not right, and his heart was not right. And we're going to see that. And also we find, very simply, that he was attacked by the fellowship. Three million people every day murmured against Moses. So here you have a man that you sometimes say, well, why did God spend 40 years of his life in the wilderness? This is why. Because when you are done in the wilderness with God, after 40 years, you can face Friends that forsake you, family that forsake you, and a fellowship that forsakes you. And you don't become bitter. In fact, what you really do do is you fall on your face before God and you say, God, I'm not really in charge, you're in charge. Korah said, no, I'm in charge. Korah did not understand the real issue of life. He was so discontent, unhappy, he wanted authority, and he thought that would get it. It's the worst type of things to look at. Korah was about to turn on Moses. And the Bible says pride goes before a fall. When, en when en envy enters the heart, the discontent and impatience takes over. 
interesting, his name, Korah, the name means ice. He was as cold as ice. And so here we have these men were renowned. Not only did he turn the hearts of himself, but he also turned some of the family members of uh, Reubenites. And we also find that he was able to turn 250 men of the congregation that were renowned. In other words, these were not flakes. He had convinced them. And that is a very frightening thought. Because if you listen very careful to what the Spirit is saying, is that you can be sucked in. You can fall for the trap. You can begin to believe somebody because so-and-so said it. That's not and should not be the way you think. You cannot believe anything until you check it out. And so the best thing you need to do in your life is get involved, find out, call the person, and get to the bottom of the issue. But if I don't do that, I'm going to believe what a friend said, and then I really shouldn't make judgment on it. Well, here we have Korah beginning to do that. They occupied a place of authority. He had authority in his life. And he represented God and called into the ministry, but he was disobedient. And he was disobedient to God because he was rebellious. He was disobedient to God because he was coveting something that God did not give him. He was disobedient to God because he was now causing an insurrection among the people of God. And we don't see that. And that's what I want to kind of tell you. When you are conceited, everyone sees it but yourself. Think of Jonah. Let me give you a great illustration. Jonah went down to the bottom of the ship, fell asleep. The waves came and the storm came and they hit the ship. And these men on that ship who had lived on the sea, who were the best of fishermen, were afraid. They threw their food over. They threw everything, they threw everything over the side. And the one man that was sound asleep was the guy causing the problem. It was Jonah. So Jonah was asleep. When they got rid of Jonah, everything stopped. So you can be a dad on the couch watching TV, snoring, and you are causing major problems in the family. You've yelled at your wife. You've cursed at the kids. You've caused all kinds of problems. There's no happiness in your home. And you wake up and you're hungry. Bless your heart. But the problem is you don't see it. And the reason why is because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It is the heart of Lucifer. And when it becomes the heart of Lucifer, because Lucifer rebelled, he drew a third part of the stars. When you get into taking and dividing and causing an insurrection, you are in serious trouble. It's a dangerous thing. And so, four things I want to teach you this morning. Number one, we see the sinner. Number two, we see also their sin. Number three, we see the separation. And number four, we see them swallowed up. Kind of an interesting story. So let's start. Number one, we see the sinner. Korah was a Levite. He was one of the priesthood. And there were 250 prince men of renown. Now Korah, we see his name mentioned. He was a son of Kohath or the Kohathites. And then we find also here, uh, we find Dathan and Abram. And these rose up before Moses, so they stood against Moses. Now, we do that. We don't think we do it, but we do it. We stand against people. We stand against our boss. We stand against authority. We have a chip on our shoulder. We stand against God. I don't think I need to read the Bible every day. In other words, we are rebellious. But our sinful nature is rebellious. So when you are in God's Word, that's a supernatural thing. When you repent, the Bible says all heaven goes crazy. Why? It is a supernatural thing. When you are loving people, it is a supernatural thing. It is natural in your body to bear envy and hate and jealousy and all that malice. But that is not from heaven. It's from hell. But when you've been born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, God begins to open your eyes. And now you're walking in the Spirit of God. They rose up before Moses. They rose up against Him. And not only that, they gather themselves together. 
So they were now bringing people in. Here Moses is trying to get people to the promised land. He had to deal with the 12 spies. He had to deal with his own family. Now he has to deal with his own leadership. And they are turning against him and find out they were undermining the work of God. Korah had a spirit of rebellion and also that spirit of slander and jealousy. Now who else had that? There was a day that David slew Goliath, remember? And the Bible says they begin to sing a song. A thousand to Saul, ten thousand to David. And here is an interesting thought. In one verse in the book of Samuel, it says, from that moment, Saul began to eye David. And for the next 15 years, Saul chased David trying to kill him because the jealousy took over, because a rebellious heart would not turn to God. And when you look at rebellion, you have to take envy and jealousy and greed and uncontentment and all that stuff goes with it. And so we see that in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. It's on your screen. They were dead wrong. Proverbs 6, verse 16. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seventh are an abomination to Him. So seven things are an abomination. Number one, a proud look. Now, how do you have a proud look? I mean, I remember in high school, the girls used to, go, the girls used to say, oh. <laughs> and the guys used to flip their hair, you know. I used to at one time. No more. But, you know, a proud look to a lying tongue. It's just so easy to lie. Third, hands that shed innocent blood. Number In verse 18, number four, a heart that devises wicked imaginations. You think things up. You build things up. Sometimes women are real guilty of just letting their mind go crazy. It, and you can kind of understand it a little bit. They're, just, they're not cold. They're freezing to death. They're not hungry. They're starving to death. So as high as they go is how far they go down. And so sometimes Satan can take a woman and give her such a great insight, and then sometimes God can take a woman and lie to her like crazy, and she listens and doesn't know where to stop. And she needs to put a period on it and bring everything into the authority of God. And so a heart that it has imagination of mind, feet that is swift running to mischief, and a false witness, number six, that speaketh lies. And check out number seven, he that sows discord among the brethren. In other words, you're, hey, did you hear what so-and-so said? Hey, did you hear what so-and-so said? Hey, did you hear about that church? Hey, now wait a second. Should you be doing that? Put a lid on it. You don't need to listen to that garbage. You listen to the truth of Jesus Christ. What you can do is you can say, why don't we go talk to that pot guy right now? Or why don't we go get the girls together and talk to them? Let's get things out in the open. No, 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 no. Why? Because they're not right with God. If they were right with God, they would seek to minister and go for it. And then in verse 5, Moses was a servant of God. He knew that God had anointed him. It says here in verse 5, He spake unto Korah and to all the company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near and to him even whom he has chosen will he cause to come near unto him. Now here is a great point. I see the sinner. I see Moses. I see Korah. I see Korah lying. I see insurrection. I see pride. I see Moses talking to God, listening to God, seeking God, putting it in God's hands. I see Korah taking it and doing it himself. I see Moses giving it to God and asking God how he should do it. I see Moses, a man who was in absolute authority, asking God how he would do it. So he is now simply a messenger. He simply speaks for God. And I see a guy over here that wants all the authority so he can control whatever he wants to do. Now who's right and who's wrong? You see, Korah was out of control. And sometimes we can be a Korah. We can have so much anger in our life that we don't do anything. We come to church, everybody loves us. And we can't figure it out. And we go home, we yell at our husbands, cuss them out, 
or we go vice versa, or we love God, we trust God, and then our kids run away, and we just walk away from God. Now something's wrong. Because if you're going to walk away from God, give up on God, when things go good or bad, you've got to make a decision right now. Good and evil come from God. So God might be testing you. The Bible says He put you in the wilderness these 40 years to test you, to prove you, and to see what was in your heart. And there's no other way for God to show you what's wrong with you and show me what's wrong with me except stick me in the hospital and stick you where He has to stick you. And there God begins to get the truth out because now I'm focused. God, I need your help. And so I realized very simply, it's kind of cool. In Jude chapter 11, verse 13, or Jude, uh, no chapter 1, just verse 11 through 13, Woe to them who have gone the way of Cain, interesting, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and perish in the rebellion of Korah. So you're going to perish. So here I see the sinner. But second, I also see their sin. I see their sin. And notice their heart is evil. It says in verse 3, they gather themselves together against Moses. Are you doing that? Are you getting together and turning on a girlfriend? Or are you getting together talking about people? Are you gathering together people to build them up or tear them down? You've got to really consider this. Are you gathering people at the workplace and telling everyone how horrible your boss is? Well, I'll tell you what. You're going to get caught. That which you do in secret is going to be shouted from the housetop. And so you ought to make up a decision that is unpleasing to God. If you have a problem, you go talk to that person. And you be strong and loving, and they will respect you. And if you get fired, God will give you another job. But if all of a sudden you get fired because you've been gossiping, don't be telling me I'm being persecuted. No. You got fired because probably God fired you because you are not a witness for the glory of God. So he goes on to declare in verse 5, he spoke unto Korah and to all the company, saying, in the morning the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and who will cause him to come near unto him, even whom he has chosen will he cause to come near. Verse 6, this do, take you censers, Korah and all the company, Put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord. It shall be that the man whom the Lord does choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you. In other words, you are grabbing too much. You want too much. You are sticking your nose in places you shouldn't even be. You have so many problems in your own life. Why are you trying to help everybody else? Turn to God, and you're going to be able to help other people. But he goes on to declare in verse 9, Seeth it but a small thing. Here's the key. Seeth it a small thing unto you that God of Israel has separated you from the congregation to bring you near to Him, to service the tabernacle, to stand before the congregation, and to minister. Do you see what he's saying? Moses is trying to talk him out of it. Now, if I was Moses, I'd shoot him. But... If you're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness by yourself, you're going to come out a different man. So instead of trying to get rid of this guy, Moses is a shepherd trying to win him. And so he begins to say to him, don't you know that you're special? Because out of everybody, God has called you to stand before him. And God has called you to represent him and help him because you're going to prepare things. And by the way, Korah, you're the guy that carries the Ark of the Covenant from one place to another. And you're the guy that carries, you know, the candlesticks. And you're the guy that carries the showbread. God has given you the highest position of all positions, but you still want more. You see, when you get to that point, it's not, I want more. It's like, I lost Jesus. It's, I, I need material things to fill the gap, to fill the void. And I'm going to tell you, as honest as I can, it will never fulfill you. You can try to fill it, you can try to do it, but it will never work. You just need Jesus Christ. And then he says here, in verse 10, he brought thee to near him. He brought God near to you. So Korah 
Why are you going to throw this away? What are you doing? Their motive was evil. Notice in verse 11 through 15. For which cause both thou and all the company gathered together against the Lord. That is mind-boggling. No, I thought it was Moses. No, it's against the Lord. Who put Moses there? God. When you attack me, who do you attack? God. Unless I'm wrong and need to go. But really, in all sincerity, we realize that you are now attacking God. Have you thought about that? So here is a shepherd who is humble and broken, doing everything he can not to destroy Korah, but to try to save him. You realize that you stand before God. You realize that you stand between death and life. Do you understand that God has chosen you? Why do you want more? Why do you want what you cannot have? You know that. Why do you have to have this power? And it's so obvious here. Verse 12, Moses said to Dothan the very same thing, come, and he wouldn't come. So Dothan wouldn't even come. And the reason why? They blame Moses for not taking him into the Canaan. And so we see, we can see their sins. Their sin is so obvious. Their heart is not right. Their motive is not right. And when you find somebody gossiping, or you find somebody lying, or you find somebody cheating, you can simply say their heart is not right and you're not judging them. If you find somebody that you've attacked and they are worshiping God and they're praying about it and they'll get back with you, <laughs> that's a pretty neat thing. Not very many of those people. You have to seek God. Thirdly, see the separation. See the separation. It's never easy. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, I will receive you. I'll be a father to you, and ye will be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. This is such a powerful thought. You're going to have to make a choice from this world in which we live. And some of us are in that area that we're living outside of marriage. We're not married, but we're living with somebody or we're dating somebody, or we're sleeping with somebody. What is God saying to you today? You have to get out of that relationship. Come out because you're disobedient to God. And God cannot bless it. If you have children, let's get you married and find help. We'll get you counsel. But to stay in that because you're afraid to leave and there's no one there to take care of you, that's not true. And so often we find so many women get caught. They want to get out, but they can't because they have nowhere to go. Well, I'll tell you what, I think the church of Jesus Christ should really help. And I look at this and I say, God help us. We have to separate. And we finally make the right decision. So now we're all on one side. No, not really. Because then we begin to serve God. And everything's hunky-dory, right? You just got saved. Things are cool. And then you find there's a bunch of hypocrites. You're not a hypocrite yet. But you will be probably one day. And so here you are loving everybody and this, a brother stabs you in the back. You hire a Christian and they're the worst workers in the world so you have to fire them. And then they, you go on a date with a brother and his hands are all over you. You call me. You know, it's just, what happened? So now you have to make a second separation. And this is where it really counts. Because Korah made a decision and Moses made a decision. It says here, Korah chose the side of Satan. And chapter 16, verse 17, Take every man his censer and put incense therein. Bring them before the Lord. Verse 18, They took every man his censer, put fire in them, laid incense thereon, and stood in the door of the tabernacle. Now i got to tell you, the glory of the Lord came. The Shaganic glory was now filled in the place. Here's what's crazy. And here's a man who is going against God's will because he wasn't born into the family of Aaron. He's now fighting for a position that he has to destroy and separate the body of Christ. He has to lie, and he's standing in the very presence of God at the very door of the tabernacle and has no problem with it whatsoever. That's like you being here lying to your wife. That's, uh, it just drives me crazy. Verse 19, Korah gathered all the congregation together unto the door. He had 250 men. 
renowned men. They were there. They were ready. They knew they were right. There was no doubt in their mind. Moses, check it out, verse 21, separate yourself from among the congregation. Why? Have you ever said to somebody when they're not pleasing God, you kind of back up and say, oh, I'm backing away from you, and they say, why? Because I don't want to get smitten by the lightning coming down. Have you ever made that joke? Well, it's not a joke. It's right here. So they finally all come to the tabernacle. They're all ready, and God whispers in Moses' ears, now, would you step away? Okay, why? Come back, a little bit back. Why? Because I'm going to smote them. I'm going to kill them. I'm going to show them who's in charge. I'm going to put this rebellion down. I'm going to bury the heart of Lucifer. I'm going to have nothing to do with people that do this stuff. And we call ourselves Christians. And yet, we go to places we shouldn't go, and we do things we shouldn't do, and we use words we shouldn't use, and we think it's okay because we haven't been toast. Well, how long the day's coming? And we see Moses said here that I might consume them, verse 21. And they fell on their faces, Moses. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, get up from among the tabernacle core. And lastly, see them swallowed up. Check it out. We see here, it was unexpected. Verse 24, seek unto the congregation, saying, get you up from among the tabernacle. Moses rose up and went. Verse 26, he said to the congregation, depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing, lest you will be consumed with sin. Now, I do like this because God's given Korah a second chance. He's now saying to everybody, get away from these men. He's very open and honest. So they got up, verse 27, from the tabernacle, Korah, and they went too, and their tents, their wives, and their sons. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things. I have not done them of my own mind. Now check out verse 29. If these men die a common death, or after I am gone and men rise up and kill them for what they did, then the Lord did not send me. But, verse 30, if the Lord make a new thing and the earth opens and swallows them up and they go down quickly into the pit, ye will understand these men have provoked God. <laughs> okay, great. Verse 31, it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words, the ground opened up and destroyed them. I imagine God was saying, get it done, speak a quickie, I, I'm ready to get rid of this. And the earth opened. And not only did they die, their children and wives died, and their homes were taken, everything was taken, and the earth closed back up. Now that is a great way to solve a problem. Now, whose side are you on, by the way? Hey, baby, Moses, you have been our man all the time. Nah. But what I want to end with a thought, this tonight, is that when I look at this story, I understand rebellion. I understand the heart of Lucifer. I understand that in your mind, you're right. They're wrong. They should call you you shouldn't have to call them. That you should not have to reach out. They should reach out to you. And I'm going to say to you, I disagree with you. Because if you're right, then you should be willing to reach out. And when you can no longer reach out, and when you can no longer make a phone call, and when you don't want to deal with those people, and you can write people off, I say, your heart is not right before God. And you better check it, because the people you're mad at, they might have an answer to why they left you. They probably left you because of your rebellion. The absence of God in your life. So, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It is the heart of Lucifer. But Moses, who was absolutely in charge, never stopped going to God. Korah didn't need God. 
Moses needed God. Who are you going to serve? Be careful. Because 250 of the most renowned men of all of Israel got caught. It's easy to gossip. It's easy to put people down. It's hard to be a servant of the Most High God.